Good morning, and welcome to the Seaside Assembly of God on the 17th of July. Uh, the one I wanted to share for the recording today, uh, part of it is in uh, Numbers 14, 2, and that says, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or also, or if only we had died in this wilderness. And this came from the Daily Bread. Uh, and I thought this was rather apropos of things that we have going on in our lives. You might start your journey in the southwest United States in a dusty town called Y, Arizona. Heading across country, you would, would take you through uncertain Texas, ultimately, uh, or excuse me, bearing northwest. You'd make a rest stop in dismal, Pennsylvania, uh, dis dismal Tennessee. There we go. Having a little trouble reading with this. I need size 14 font. Ultimately, you'd reach your destination, Panic, Pennsylvania. These are real places across the landscape of America, though not likely a trip you'd ever choose to take. Sometimes this is exactly what the journey of life feels like. We easily identify with the Israelites' tough life in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 2.7. Life can be hard, but, we see, but do we see the other parallels? We create our own itinerary, turning from God's every way. Like the Israelites, we often grumble about getting our needs met. That's what we were talking about earlier today. We want to tell God how to do things instead of doing, it, what, doing what God has called us to do. In our daily fretting, we likewise doubt God's purposes. The story of the Israelites is repeated over and over in our own. God assures us that if we follow his path, he'll deliver us into a far better place than dismal. He'll provide and will lack nothing we really need. And that's if you read that in Deuteronomy 2, 7 and Philippians 4, 19. Yet as much as we already know this, we often fail to do this. That's knowing and then practicing. You've got to actually practice it. And that's one reason why you spend every day in the word. Because as you do that, you'll come to realize that you can actually put it into practice. I know sometimes I have to stop what I'm doing and going, wait a minute. Nope, that's not who I am. God has chosen me a different path. And I have to stop and remember that. We need to follow God's roadmap. How many of us has also ever tried to read a roadmap? Some of us can't do that. Or we try to listen to GPS and it takes us all sorts of weird ways. I had a friend of mine who ended up in the middle of an Indian reservation and had no clue how to get out of there because she followed her GPS. She didn't have it set right. If we have our set on Jesus, we can always go in the right direction. It's a bit more of a drive, but another six hours by car would take you from the town of Panic to a place known as Assurance, West Virginia. If we let God direct our paths, Psalm 119.35, we'll journey in joy with him at the wheel. Blessed assurance, indeed. So that's something to remember. God knows what our path should be, and we need to follow that path for him. Lord God, as we've been talking about today, we just need to rely on you. We need to open our eyes to you, Lord God, and we would have blessed assurance that you're in control. So many times we panic, Lord, and we think we know the way, or we think that maybe you didn't get it right. Maybe you didn't hear us, Lord God. Or maybe you're asleep, you've turned off the cell phone, whatever it is, Lord God. But we need to focus on you. We need to focus on your path. We need to focus on surrender to you, Lord God. You know what you're doing. You know that you have our paths straight for us, Lord God, and we can rely. And Lord God, we can trust in you. We thank you for every moment of that, Lord God. We thank you for your presence in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for that still, small voice. We thank you for the security that we can rest in you, Lord. We ask you to be with the rest of the service, be with the pastor, as, Lord God, he brings the message that your spirit would rule and reign in our life in every way possible, Lord. We love you and praise you in your name. Amen.
I guess you never turned it off, right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, this morning, we're going to look in Romans chapter 12. If you'd like to turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at being a good teammate. My name is Rick. I am the interim pastor. Next Sunday, Chris Weber and his family will be presenting their ministry, and we'll find out if they're going to be our pastors. So pray for us, and we all should pray for each other, right? <laughs> anyway, we're looking at being a good teammate. Team building is an ongoing process. I looked it up earlier and said that it's a process that helps a group evolve into a cohesive unit. Maybe you've been part of team building on your job or different places. But God wants the church to be a team too, doesn't he? He wants individual churches to work together. And that's what we're going to be looking at. He did the same thing with his disciples. The 12 disciples became a team. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and the church became a team, didn't they? And that's what God desires for this church. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 very familiar, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has a plan for us, doesn't he? And he has a playbook. I don't know if you were in sports earlier in your life, or maybe you are now sometimes. Maybe you've been on a softball team, basketball team, football team. Anyway, there's a lot of different kind of sports we could go into, but teamwork is something that's important in a lot of different areas of life. We're not to just do our own thing, are we, as believers or as church members? We're to study and execute the playbook. What's the playbook? It's the Bible, isn't it? God has given us a playbook and he expects us to use it. There's a lot of uh, godly wisdom in the playbook. In fact, this week I was on YouTube and I was looking at uh, an interview with Britt McCracken. He wrote a book called The Wisdom Pyramid. And he was talking about one day he was looking at the food pyramid as compared to the wisdom pyramid of the Bible. And he was talking about the food pyramid. You know, you probably remember it from your days in school or some other things, restaurants or whatever, where you have the, at the bottom, you have all the grains, the rice and all that. Then you have, I wrote it down here. Then you go to the uh, vegetables and the fruits, then the dairy and the meat and the nuts and the legume area, and then the very tip, not very much of it, you're supposed to have healthy fats and all that to make your diet complete. Well, the same thing is true with wisdom in our lives too. A lot of us as Americans get our wisdom from things that aren't so good. We kind of invert the uh, wisdom pyramid and in his wisdom pyramid, he had uh, different things he had, the Bible should be our foundation, shouldn't it? It should be the most that we're taking in. And then the next level, he had the church. We need uh, wisdom that comes from a communion, you no know, common community wisdom. That's why we come together. Two are better than one. Three is even better. More and more is even better. You know, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, and then, you know, we have the books, Christian books, uh, art. You know, there's a lot of movies. There's all kinds of things that we can go into. And then he talked about rest. We need rest. And that's one of the things that many Christians are kind of getting behind on a lot of times these days because what age are we living in? We're living in the information age, aren't we? Did you know that the average adult now takes in five times more information than 50 years ago. 50 years ago, 
your grandparents took in only 20% daily is what you take in. We have all these gadgets that we look at, don't we? Think of all the screen time we take in. What do we have for screen time? We have phones. How many hours a day do you spend on your phone? Guilty. <laughs> we have uh, tablets. Some of us have tablets. We're on those a lot. We have laptops. We have desktops. We have television. How many watch television before they go to bed? They're sitting in their recliner watching television. People that are gamers. How many hours can you spend on a gaming system? Over and over again. No, many, many hours. And that takes away from a lot of the uh, rest that we could have. In uh, He quoted a man named Dick Lucas, one of the people that was interviewing, and he said, Dick Lucas says, we're either giving into the pressure of the world or the pressure of the word. I thought that was a pretty good saying. We're either giving into the pressure of the world or we're giving into the pressure of the word. If you don't have very much word in you, God can't put a whole lot of pressure on your conscience, can he? But if you're saturating your mind with all other kinds of things from all other sources, that's why he says here, and you've heard sermons many times on these two verses about renewing your mind and getting the right, you know, the right things in, the right things come out. You know, you think of uh, bad habits. There's so much information going into us, into our minds and our hearts, that actually we're becoming like information gluttons, really. Just think of all the things you scroll through, all the things you look at, all the things you read, all the different things you don't think, oh, I don't want that, I keep going, going through YouTube or whatever you're doing. And you can just keep going and going. You can spend hours just going down different rabbit trails. And there's so much information that we have to be careful because God wants us to be good teammates. If a person's in sports and all they do is become a couch potato and a snack on the chips and cookies, candy, all of the wonderful things that we love that are not really all, supposed to be on the food pyramid, but they are <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Just think of what happens to us as, as believers. Now, we get all of these things going into us. It kind of takes over everything. 50 years ago, when our grandparents were no adults. What was there? There was the morning paper, if they got it, and there was the evening news for one hour on ABC, CBS, or NBC, and that was about it. There was no CNN. There was nothing. <laughs> it was just three channels, and that was about it. Now, Think of all the different channels, all the different choices, all the different things you have to bowl over and think about. We're just used to it, aren't we? But God wants us to be part of a good team that's taking care of themselves and that's in shape. Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace of given to me, everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And then we could go on and it says, for, in verse 4, for we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we're on this team, even in this church we're on a team, but all the people in this church don't do the same things. We all have different talents we all have different skills. We all have different giftings. And t God doesn't want us to be trying to do something that we're not really qualified for, that it's not the best thing that we should be doing. He wants us to be good teammates. I remember when I was in high school, I played on a basketball team, and the principal's son was the uh, star shooting guard on the team. The only bad part was we lost a few games because he was a ball hog. <laughs> some days he was hot and some days he wasn't. And so everything kind of revolved around him. But that's not the way it's supposed to be in the church, is it? It's not supposed to be revolve around one person. We're all supposed to be involved and we're all teammates. And 
Romans 12, 4 says that we have many members in one body, but all these members don't have the same function. The same thing is true with pastors. We have a pastor coming next week, Chris Weber. Three of us have met him. Some of us have watched him or listened to him in some of his sermons from where he was before in Corvallis. And he's going to be a different kind of a pastor. He's going to be different than Pastor Rawls. We came here, Pastor Rawls was the pastor. He'd been the pastor for 25 years. He had his strengths and he had his weaknesses. He told me some of his strengths and weaknesses. And then Pastor Jepson has been our pastor for the last five years, and he just retired. He's on vacation right now. He still lives in the area. But he had different strengths than Pastor Rawls did. And he was a different pastor in some ways, and he helped us do some things that needed to be accomplished. And then our new pastor, if it's Pastor Chris or someone else, they're going to have different strengths. Pastors wear many different hats, and some pastors have strengths in different areas. I went through a, a list of things that pastors may have strengths in, strengths in. Some are scholars. Some of people are like authors, they write books, they're really deep into theology, and they're like the Bible answer man type people. Some people are caregivers. They're like shepherds. They seldom miss something that's going on in the congregation. They're acquainted with all the needs, and they take care of all those. Some people are like evangelistic preachers. A lot of the people that are on television and different people you see, now they have a voice, they, they are oozing the gospel. Some people are leaders. You know, they help other people learn how to lead their churches, like John Maxwell, famous leadership person. Some are counselors. They enjoy one-on-one -on -one counseling. Some of them, that's what they do. They're on staff at a church, and they're a pastoral counselor. Some people are team builders. They're like associate pastors. They help all the different functions of the church go. Some people are maintenance men. Pastors, a lot of times in small churches, have to help make sure the building is maintained and the property and all that. Like Pastor Rawls was pretty good at that. Some people are like prophets, like uh, they're on you know, big voices. They understand church culture, and they also understand the American culture, what it needs to hear. No, they're not afraid to be a voice. You seldom have ever hear them avoid a tough issue. They just speak out on things. Some people are disciple makers. Some people are like involved in missions very much. Some become missionaries. Anyway, you could go on and on. Some are administrators. Some are all different kinds of things. Many times in a small church, and take this into notice, that many small church pastors have to wear all, all these hats at different times. <laughs> it's not easy to be a small church pastor because you're expected to do everything well, but is that realistic? Probably not. <laughs> so anyway, just think of that and pray about that. That's why the body of Christ has different kinds of pastors that need to come at different times and accomplish different things in the church. Going on in Romans chapter 12, verse 5 through 8, it goes through a list of different ministry gifts. This isn't totally inclusive, but now we have the list in Ephesians 4, 11 of the Fivefold gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then you have the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. You also have this list here. Let's just go through it real quickly. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And notice it's given to us. We don't earn these gifts. They're just given to us. Let us use them. And that's the important thing. If you have a gift, allow God to use you. Maybe you're good with your hands. Maybe you're good at fixing things. Maybe you're good at painting. There's some of us that have been painting on the house next door. And anyway, some of us <laughs> aren't used to climbing ladders and different things anymore, but Whatever we find to do, what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to do it with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, aren't we? But if it's prophecy, let us prophesy. 
Now, you heard a, a couple of things happen today in the church service. Those are gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we're not prophet. I'm not a prophet, but every once in a while I say something that I feel that the Lord wants me to say. That's a gift. There's other kinds of gifts. There's ministry. There's teaching. There's exhorting. What's exhorting? The word in the Greek is parakaleo. It means encouraging. Can you encourage somebody? Maybe you're not going to stand up here and say anything with a microphone, but can you encourage somebody that you are sitting in the fellowship hall with or talking to them before church or after church? You can encourage them. That's being an exhorter. It means to summon, to call upon, to strengthen. There's all different kinds of things that it means. There's uh, people that are givers. There are leaders. People usually on the church leadership team have that kind of a gift. There's mercy. Or in the NIV, it says showing mercy. In the Revised Standard, it says acts showing doing acts of mercy. Mercy is to be acted out, isn't it? If you're a merciful person, what do you do? The other person might do something that maybe you're thinking, well, that wasn't probably the best thing to do. Or you might, maybe you see something happen and you, know, you come along and you help them. You're merciful. But we're supposed to do it with cheerfulness, aren't we? If you're doing an act of mercy, it's, it'd be done with a good attitude. That's what a good team player does. In uh, the New Living Translation, it says, if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Is it always easy to do things that need to be done? <laughs> Not in church life always, is it? And so whatever we do, we're try, we try to do with the best attitude possible, don't we? And we ask God for help. Colossians 3.23 says, and whatsoever you do, how are you to do it? Half-heartedly as unto the Lord? Is that what it says? No, it says whatsoever you do, do it heartily. That means with all your heart as much as possible, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Don't do it for people so much, even though you do it because you want to help people. But remember, you're doing it for God, aren't you? You're doing it like you're doing it for Jesus. Romans 12, 9 through 11 in the New Living Translation talks about learning to love your teammates. And it's a process because do we really know each other? It takes a while to get to know people, doesn't it? Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. How do we learn to love people on our team? We get involved. We rub elbows with them. That's how we get to know people. What's their story? When you're doing things, it doesn't just have to be sitting here listening to somebody up here, but when I found out more things about our neighbor next door because we were painting and doing things, scraping paint, painting, and what do you do? Are you just going to do it quietly all by yourself, or are you going to talk? Are you going to talk? I asked, no, you it's good to learn to get a whiff of people's lives. What's a whiff? What's their work? What, are they, what kind of work did they used to do if they don't work anymore, if they're retired? Or what are they doing now? What kind of work do they do now? I is interest. What kind of interest do they have? Just, is it all about church? Is it all about work? People have hobbies and they have other things they like to do. The F is family. What kind of family do they have? Maybe they struggle in their family, but, if you find that out, you can, uh, you can pray for their family, can't you? So work, interest, and family. That's how you're part of a team. If you're a part of a team in sports, the longer you're together, you're at practices, you're out uh, playing you know, in competition and doing different things, the more you're together, the more you get to know people. You see their family. You get to know their family. They come and they watch the game. It happens all the time, and that's the same thing with church. Church is a place where we get to know people 
It's a part of our life, but you can do the same thing at work, can't you? You get a whiff of the person at work. The longer you work with them, the more you know about them. Because this isn't the only place where we're doing ministry, is it? We're, everywhere we go, we're doing ministry. Because the Holy Spirit is with you. So whether you're at work, whether you're doing something socially with somebody, or whether you're in a church activity or doing church things, God wants us to rub elbows with people and get to know them. That's what Jesus did. That's why everybody liked Jesus. He was a regular person, wasn't he? He didn't put on airs. He didn't try to be anything you know, stupendous and really you know, dignified. He was just a regular down-to-earth person, and the common person could come to Jesus. In uh, verse 10, it says, love each other with genuine affection and de take delight in honoring each other, like being on a team. Like uh, recently, little Bella, she's on vacation this week, but little Bella, Penny and I went to watch some of her t-ball games. It was kind of fun. I hadn't seen one for a long time, but... Uh, you know, you're an adult, you're watching, and you're, you, a lot of guys are used to watching like the World Series or college or you know, Major League Baseball games. It's not going to be anything like that. <laughs> they don't even know where to run or where to go. The, the ball's up on the little podium thing, and they're swinging and missing it, or they're, you better watch out. They might actually hit <laughs> and let go of the bat, but you just enjoy what they're doing. It's fun to watch, and that's how it is a lot of times with young Christians that are new, they don't know everything about how to be a Christian, but you just kind of take it with a grain of salt because you know they're not going to stay young like that forever. They're going to learn as they go. And that's what God wants us to do and take delight. A lot of people take delight in going to watch. They're not really great games to watch. <laughs> Everybody gets to bat. Nobody really gets put out because nobody can throw the ball that far or they don't know what base to throw it to or they can't uh, feel the grounder. <laughs> but it's still fun to watch. But what does everybody do? They say, good job, great effort. And that's what God wants us to do. And if they, uh, <laughs> if they don't do so good and maybe they trip and they fall down, what do you do? You just cheer them on, don't you? Get up, support people as much as possible. And that's what God wants us as Christian teammates to do too. Verse 11 says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. God wants us to be enthusiastic as much as possible. I'm not, no, not every single day are you going to be like up on cloud nine. It's kind of like unrealistic. No days go by and things are up and down in life, but. What do you do? You do the best you can with the tools you've got. And you try to be a good teammate and encourage your other teammates. In uh, the New King James, it says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. What is somebody that's lagging doing? It's kind of like sometimes what I used to do when I was in PE when I was in high school. Well, we had to run laps around the football field. <laughs> I would kind of just amble along, and I wasn't really in that bad of shape, but I just didn't really want to do it. <laughs> so I was kind of lagging behind, and the coach would say, come on, come on, Morris, get going. <laughs> anyway, that's not how we should be as a, a believer. We should not be lagging and be a laggard. But we should be a person that is trying to be somebody that helps the team, somebody that is doing what's good. I remember when I was in boot camp in uh, the Navy in uh, San Diego, I uh, took the easy way out. One of my friends that I went to high school with in the church I grew up in in north central Washington, he went in the Navy before I did. He was a couple years older than me, and he told me, when you go to boot camp and they ask if you want to join you no know, one of the uh, special special companies 
see if you can get in one of those. They had like uh, the drum and bugle corps was one of them. At graduation, we all went out and we played these horns and stuff, and we we marched. All the other people every day they had to go out in the nice San Diego warm sun, and they had to march around with rifles and stand out there, you know, practicing marching and parade rests and all these different rifle positions and I got to go sit in a nice shady classroom and in a chair and play a horn and learn how to play about three or four songs for graduation. So in this special company, we had this one guy that he was kind of struggling and we had to, we didn't really have much exercise. We did a little bit, but to pass our test, we had to run a mile at the end. Anyway, we were all running all uh, about, I think, I forgot how many there are in a company, but there's quite a few. So we're running around this area, and it was all mapped out for us. But this one guy, we all had to make it, too. We all had to, you know, you couldn't drop out or you didn't pass. All the rest of us would, but you wouldn't. And so this one guy, he was really struggling. He, he was huffing and puffing. He wasn't making it. So we had to kind of help him. Some of us grabbed on his, each side of him, and we pulled him along with this because he was gonna. He said he wasn't gonna make it. He was gonna just drop out. But God doesn't want any of us to drop out, does He? He wants us to help the other person to make it across the line, and that's what being diligent is all about. It's not just about being diligent for yourself, but it's about being diligent for the other person too, isn't it? Romans twelve. 12 says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. God wants us to be rejoicing as much as possible as we go through life, in our church life, in our personal lives, family lives. He wants us to be rejoicing as much as possible. I remember one lady in our church where we used to be, she said, you know what rejoicing is, don't you? And I said, yeah, it means you keep being joyful as much as possible. And he said, you, th you divide it, re-joy. I never thought of it that way before. To rejoice means to not just joy, but you re-joy. Sometimes we have to re-joy, don't we? Because life isn't always easy. And so you have to choose to joy again and rejoice. Because there is tribulation in life. We have to be rejoicing in hope. And what is hope? We looked at hope a few weeks ago. Hope is looking at things. If you're hoping for something, it's not there yet. You don't see it. Why would you hope for something that you already have? And sometimes in church life, we don't see everything that we're hoping for yet. But we keep praying and we keep pressing and we keep rejoicing and we keep doing the work of the Lord and we keep being steadfast in prayer. And even during tribulation and troubles, we are patient, aren't we? God wants us to be patient, steadfast, and continuing steadfastly in prayer. He doesn't want us to be whiners as Andrew was talking about in his uh, reading from the Daily Bread, like the children of Israel were, because whiners are annoying, aren't they? <laughs> on a team, have you ever seen anybody on a little kid's team, little league or something, and there's a person that's whining all the time? Are they popular with the rest of the team? <laughs> no. And it taxes the uh, abilities of the coaches. To be a whiner is not what God is looking for. He, he's able to help us, but that's not what he's looking for. He wants us to be not a whiner, but a winner, right? A good winner. What's a good winner? The opposite of a bad winner. What's a bad winner? It's like one of those really proud, stuck-up kind of, well, I'm really hot. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to this team. Is that the kind of winner God wants us to be? No, he doesn't want us to be that kind of a winner. He wants us to be a good winner, a winner that can win with grace, a winner that still thinks about how the other person's feeling. He wants us not to be sore losers, but he wants us to be 
good losers, doesn't it? Because do we always win in every situation in life? Does the church always have constantly, everything gets better and better and there's never any problems? Is that realistic? It's not, is it? And the same thing is not going to happen no matter who the next pastor is. There's always going to be some kind of a problem. There's always going to be something that the enemy of our souls is going to try to do. He's going to always try to trip us up somehow. So God wants us to be praying for whoever the next pastor is. He wants us to be supporting whoever the next pastor is. He wants us to have a good attitude and to be on, be good team members. Remember, team, it's about how you play the game, right? It's, about, it's not winning and losing. It's about how you play the game. Is everybody going to enjoy the journey? That's what we want, isn't it? God wants us to enjoy the journey, and a good attitude goes a long way. So be patient. Keep a good attitude and keep on praying and keep on working. Romans 12, 13, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. If a teammate gets hurt, what do you do? You take a time out, right? You pray for them. You do what needs to be done. You try to make it as best as possible. The last part of the verse there says in the New King James, it says, be given to hospitality. Sometimes new People come on the team. What happens? Are we supposed to be kind of cliquish and think, well, look at that person. No, we're not supposed to look down our nose at anybody. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be given to hospitality. That means to make people feel welcome. God wants everybody on the team to feel welcome, doesn't he? He wants people to feel part of the team. And so... He says, be hospitable. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. No, I don't want to do that. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's the way of the world, isn't it? We're not supposed to be cursing people. We're supposed to be blessing people. Now, we have an opposing team too, don't we? We do have an opposing team. Sometimes our opposing team doesn't play nicely. Their coach isn't very nice, is he? He's a fallen angel. And he, what does he do? He thinks he's the God of this world, but he's only got a small G in the New Testament. He doesn't have the big G. So he's just a figment of his own imagination, isn't he? <laughs> but Jesus... He is the Lord, and he wants us to be like he is. And our team doesn't play the same way that the enemy of our soul's team plays. We play fairly. We try to be as nice as possible. We don't try to intimidate. We don't try to change the rules in the middle of the game. We don't cheat. We do things the right way with integrity. And that's what God wants us to do on his team is be people of integrity. Don't give in to complaining and whining. Don't throw temper tantrums. Anybody ever throw a temper tantrum in your life? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> but God doesn't want us to stay immature and be a person that's prone to temper tantrums. Well, I'm just going to take my ball and go home. That's really great for everybody to see, isn't it? Now he wants us to do what's right, play the, by the rules, and most of all, just stay in the game. Stay in the game. Romans 12, 15 and 16, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Job and his three friends in the book of Job, in the very first part, they didn't say anything to him. They just saw how sad, sad he was and how rough he was, and they just, they just stayed there, and they were trying to be a comfort to him. They didn't, 
go into any great details, but what happened after a while? They got going back and forth, and they weren't really, Job wasn't in a good place, and then they all weren't in a good place. That's not what God wants. He does want us to rejoice with those who rejoice, if they're rejoicing for the right reasons. But if somebody's going through a tough time, it's good to hug somebody sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes a hug does more than anything you can say. And so he wants us to realize that our presence sometimes means more, more than our words. So he wants us to use godly wisdom in that area. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Or, as it says in the New Living Translation, it says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. What? I don't? <laughs> the longer you're alive, the more you realize you don't know, right? I don't know everything. I've been reading the Bible for over 40 years, but I still don't know everything in this book. There's a lot of people that know way more than I do. Maybe you're one of them. But the main thing is to just keep studying and keep doing what you need to do and live in harmony. Do you ever hear somebody that's out of harmony? <laughs> when you hear somebody that's not in tune with what's going on in a musical score, it stands out, doesn't it? The same thing is true with us as believers. If we're not careful, we can be causing a great, I don't know how to say it, I guess, but maybe I'll just, you know what I mean. Don't be wise in your own opinion. I read earlier in the New King James that I wrote in my Bible it says, whose opinion, whose opinion is it? Don't be wise in your own opinion. It's your opinion. It's my opinion. Just because I have an opinion doesn't mean that it's right. Anybody ever change your mind on something that you used to believe in the Bible that maybe you were taught earlier that wasn't exactly right about the Bible? <laughs> we learn as we go, and sometimes we have to unlearn some things we learned before. Romans twelve seventeen: Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, notice that it has an if there. It's not always, but if it is possible, as much as depends on you, for our part, live peaceably with all men. It's kind of a not a, always an easy thing to do in the United States and other countries these days, but Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is God's, isn't it? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. That sounds kind of mean, Pastor to heap coals of fire on somebody's head. I wouldn't want anybody to do that to me. Anyway, there's a lot of people who have wondered about this verse in the Bible. Anyway, uh, there's different viewpoints on it. One that I think is pretty good is in the Bible days, they didn't have matches. <laughs> they didn't have uh, lighters. And so... People would take coals from one house to another, sometimes to light a fire. And I guess they put them on like ceramic pots or something, and they would carry them. And if you saw your neighbor's coal in his pot was going out, you would uh, tell him to come to your house and, hey, you are you need some more heaped on that? Or? Anyway, that's what they say. Some people believe that's what it means. Because I don't believe God is wanting to heap coals of fire on anybody's head. But I think he does want us to help our enemies, doesn't he? To do good to those that despitefully use us and persecute us. 
and to realize that God is going to take care of things eventually, isn't he? So do what you can to make sure his will is done, but remember, don't give in to the pressure of the world. Give in to the pressure of the word. Because the world's going to try to pressure you, but God wants you to listen to his word. He wants you to be ruled by his word. And finally, in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Remember, you're on God's team, aren't you? God's team is a good team. How does God's team overcome? God's team overcomes with good. God's team overcomes with good. Don't let evil conquer you, but you conquer evil by doing good, as it says in the New Living Translation. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That's the people on the same team as you are. So what's God saying to the church? The game is almost over. It's been going on for almost 2,000 years now. And about the year 2030, it'll be about 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead and the church started. We're in the fourth quarter. We're getting to the end. The game's almost over. So team, we're in a timeout here at the church this morning. Work together. That's what coaches say. That's what our my basketball coach in high school used to always say, come on, you guys, work together. You know what to do. Work together. Give it all you've got. It's almost over. It's almost over. We're not going to forfeit. We're not going to we're not going to throw in the towel. We're not going to quit the game. It's almost over. Let's go. And then what we do? A lot of different sports do this. Baseball does it. Especially basketball, there's only five guys playing on the floor at the same time. We would put our hands, the whole team, because there's usually only about 12 people on a team. We put our hands in the middle, and the coach would put his hand on top. And then we'd say, let's go, and we'd all throw our hands down. And that's what God is saying to us today as the church. It's almost over. The world's almost reached, but not quite. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. And then he would say, all right, put your hands in. As you go out to church today, the mission feels out the door, isn't it? Okay, let's go. Let's go. So this week, Continue to do what needs to be done and continue to live your life as only you can do because you're in a special place that only you are prepared for. And Lord, we thank you. Stand together and thank you for coming this morning. For those of you that are members, remember next week we're going to be voting and meeting our uh, pastoral candidate, a very good couple. And Lord, we thank you for Chris Weber and his family. We ask that you would keep your hand upon them. Lord, we pray that you would help us as we come together next week to hear from you, God. And we ask that you would take us forward, Lord, not only here, but around this world, Lord. We pray for your church, Lord, that you would help us to realize that it is the last quarter. There's only a few minutes left in the game. Let's not forfeit. Let's not throw a temper tantrum and go home, but let's do what we need to do, God. Let's play as a team. You're the captain. You're the owner of this, God, and we ask that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to do what we need to do. Help us to play our part. 
And we ask your blessing, Father, as we go in Jesus' name. May your will be done in our lives and in our nation in this world. Amen and amen. Amen.